Whenever Sylvia's finished, we'll get started. <laughs> it's good to see y'all in the house of the Lord this morning. I hope you didn't do any activities that were too hot. I, uh, I went to dinner with some friends here from the church, and after lunch, we went, I went home and took a nap. I had a good one. Yeah, go Jane. Well, well, last week, when we were in the book of Revelation, we moved out of a time of, of judgment, at a time of tribulation, and into a time where God's plan for the salvation of man had come to its completion. It had come to its full. And all of a sudden, all of those people that had struggled throughout the centuries in their walk with God were receiving the glory and the blessing and the benefit of being in their heavenly home. You think about what the world had experienced in those last seven years and how much of a struggle it was for so many people. And when we got into chapter 19, we began to read that this mass of humanity, just a multitude that couldn't be numbered, that made up of the saints of the Old Testament of Israel, of the Christians from the time of Christ through the end times, of all those who died in the, in the plagues and in the, in the famines and in the judgments that fell from God, and, and all of those who died at the hand of the Antichrist and the false prophet, all of a sudden they and the raptured church were there in heaven, and all of a sudden singing broke out. And the song of Moses rose, and the song of, of the Lamb rose, and the two songs blended together, and, and people were praising God the way God deserves to be praised. You know, we, we never, as a human race, have ever valued God the way He should be valued. I don't think we're capable of it. I don't think we have a large enough vision of, of who God is or how great God is. If we could catch just a little bit greater vision of God, then maybe we could worship Him a little more like He deserves. But how wonderful is it that we have this promise in the Scriptures that there's coming a day when we will see God for who He truly is. We will see Jesus Christ and understand all the things that He did. Not only are the humans there singing and praising God, so are the angels. And, and the angels, like us, have struggled to understand the plan of God for most of the time that God's been working with man. They've been involved. They brought messages to men, and they brought prophecies to men like Daniel. And they've done all these things. They, they were there when the announcement that Jesus was going to be conceived in a virgin's womb and born as a baby. They were there. They couldn't understand why or how God was going to take himself in all of his glory and reduce it down to being in this little baby. But they witnessed it. They were there when they saw him growing up. They watched him during the miracle phase of his ministry as he was healing the sick. They watched as he was arrested. Jesus himself said, I could call down legions of angels to stop this from happening. And, and it just was an amazing thing. And they, they witnessed them being nailed to the cross. I'm sure that the angels were concerned about how is, would it be possible that Jesus the only begotten Son of God could be buried in a tomb. But they were also there that morning when the stone was rolled away. And now here at the end of things, the, the celebration that's going on in heaven and God's plan has come to fruition and everyone can see how God's hand has been at work, all of a sudden they're praising and glorifying. Well, the very next thing that happens after this great worship service is a wedding Ever been invited to a wedding? How excited were you to get that invitation? <laughs> Sometimes you're excited about getting a wedding invitation. I was very excited to go and be part of my niece's, Jillian's wedding recently. And, and I've been in, involved in so many other weddings over the years. And, and, and some of those are exciting, but some of them are like, I really got to go because it's family or it's, I got this obligation or whatever the case is. And, it, and you're thinking, Lord, I hope the preacher's quick and gets this done in a hurry and the cake's good, right? But this is a wedding 
that we should really be looking forward to. Listen at the scripture in Revelation chapter 19 verses 7 through 10. Look what it says. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor. So this is the praise service, the worship service that we just went through in the first, sixes of the, first six verses of the uh, 19 of Revelation. Now we're continuing on. It says, let us be glad. Let us rejoice. Let us give honor. Remember the word honor means to put proper value on. Let us give honor to him, Jesus, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the, linen, for, fi, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now I want you to notice there's two different events here. You've got the wedding and then you've got the supper. Just like the wedding and then the reception. A little different, but similar. And it goes on, it says, Blessed is he who is called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Now this is an angel that's standing with John. And he said unto me, See that thou do not, for I am a fellow servant, and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what's he saying? He said, don't worship me, the wedding. You know, it's really interesting how God from the very beginning established traditions and patterns in the life of Israel so that we would understand different events that happened. You read in the scripture where God says, I never desired the blood of bulls or of goats or of sheep. But he instituted the sacrificial system. If he never wanted those sacrifices, why did he institute the sacrificial system? Well, he did that because he wanted us to understand when Jesus came and died on the cross, what it meant. If there had never been a sacrificial system where the sins of Israel were atoned for by the blood of, of lambs, then we would not have understood when the Lamb of God died on the cross. And you see this throughout all of history. Why did God lead the children of Israel out of Egypt right to the coast of the Red Sea? All of a sudden, they're in a strategically uh, bad situation. They're trapped between the, the sea and the Egyptian army. And God led them there. Why did he do that? So he could part the Red Sea. And so he could bring them through the passing through of the water from slavery through the water to freedom. Symbol of baptism. We understand why we are dead in our sins and our trespasses, we are buried with Christ, we are resurrected again. All of these pictures were painted so that we would understand what God wanted us to understand. Well, the wedding process in Israel was created to teach us a lesson so that we could understand what it meant for us, the church, to be married to Christ. There are several stages in a Jewish wedding. The, the first stage is, was, is called the arrangement. And, and what would happen is that the, the father of the groom would go to the father of the bride. And weddings in those days were not really about love and romance and all of that kind of thing. They were designed to strengthen both families with this particular union. The, the concept was that that love and romance would follow after the man and the woman were married and they learned to love each other. Many times the groom and the bride had not seen each other before the wedding, or at least not very much. And so there was an arrangement made. And the arrangement was, was also dictated by Jewish law and Jewish tradition. They would come and they would make a covenant with one another. And part of that covenant is that the father of the bride would establish the bride price or the dowry. Now we in Western society turn the dowry around. The dowry was when the bride would bring her treasures into the wedding. 
right? Uh, anybody ever see that movie with Maureen O'Hare and, and John Wayne? Where John Wayne is an American boxer and he retires and he goes over to Ireland and he finds... You hadn't seen this? The Quiet Man, it's called. Fantastic movie. And, and, and they, they fall in love with one another. But, but her brother, who controls the money, will not release her dowry. And she won't be married without being able to take her dowry into the wedding. And, and that's the way we do it. But in the, in the case of Israel, it was the other way around. The father of the bride would set a price based on his social status, based on his economic status, based on how desperate the father of the groom was to be able to unite these two together, and he would establish the price. And, and then once the price was established, they would make this covenant, and they would seal that covenant with a, a, a symbolic glass of wine. They would drink a glass of wine together. So the first phase would be the arrangement. The, the second phase would be the betrothal. Or the engagement, if you will. So, so once the arrangement was made, the man and the woman were legally married. Even though they didn't live together. They didn't have physical relationships together. But if they wanted to break the engagement, they actually had to go to the priest and get a writ of divorcement. They couldn't just walk away. You remember Joseph and Mary, right? And it came out that Mary was pregnant. And Joseph, it says, being a righteous man was considering what to do, and he was going to put her away privately. He didn't want to come out and make a big scene so that Mary could be taken out and stoned to death. He was going to go quietly to the priest, get a, a writ of divorce, and break that arrangement. And, and he was going to do that until the angel came and told him, hey, look, it's okay, right? Th this, this period of, of engagement often lasted at least a year. And there were two major components that were established during that year period of time. First off, it was established that the bride was pure. That she was not sexually active and that she was not pregnant. I'm going to tell you, if a girl's pregnant, you will find out within a one-year period of time that she's pregnant. There ain't going to be no hiding it, right? Uh, it, it's just the way things are. The second thing that would happen is that the groom would go and prepare a place for he and his bride to live. Generally, it was on the next floor of his father's house. They still do it in, in the Middle East. If you've ever traveled to the Middle East or seen pictures, you'll see flat-roofed houses. They don't have as big a range as we do. They have flat-roofed houses, and sticking out of the top of the houses is rebar. And that's waiting for the son to come and build another floor on top of his father's house. And so those are the two things that would happen during the betrothal period. And then the third phase would come about. And the third phase is the actual wedding ceremony. Now, for most, in, for, in most cases, the ceremony was a restricted group of people who were allowed to actually witness the marriage ceremony. Uh, it would be the, the family of the bride, the family of the groom, if you will, the the best men and, and his groomsmen and the bridesmaids that came along with the bride. That's very similar to what we do today. And then there were always two witnesses that were not related to the family that would attend. And they would be the witnesses of the wedding. I was, as I was reading about this, it's really interesting some of the things that they do. So in a Jewish wedding, when they get to a certain point, the groom stands still and the bride will circle him seven times. Seven being the number of perfect, perfection. And, and it, it is a number that, that is very important in Scripture, but it binds their relationship with that number. Then they'll, they'll share a glass of wine together. You remember? And then they'll take it and wrap it up in a cloth. And they'll put it on the ground and the two of them will... Have you ever seen it? They'll stop it. What do they say? Mazel tov, right? <laughs> Basically what that symbolism is that once that glass is broken, it cannot be put back together. There can never be a breaking of this union because that glass is broken. And that was what the covenant was based on. So you have this, the wedding ceremony. And so you have this intimate group of people. And then after the wedding ceremony comes phase four, and that is the feast, the wedding supper. 
And that's thrown out open to all kinds of invited guests that will come to the wedding supper. They don't have to be family. They come in. Uh, we, we've read stories in the New Testament about a rich man and a king who set up a, a wedding feast for their son. And the, the guests wouldn't attend, remember? Uh, one of them was too busy. One of them had a field to go look at. One had just bought a new yoke, a, a, a yoke of oxen. All these different excuses. And, and the king got mad. And the, and the rich man, they went and gathered just whoever they could get. And, and the feast was a, was a seven-day event. Interesting. Um, I've always been told that house guests and fish are similar. After three days, they both got to go. Right? But, but seven days they would come and... And they would celebrate there this wedding. It was, a, it was a really, really big deal, the weddings in those days. Well, here in, in Revelation chapter 19, we see the coming of the groom, the Lamb of God. And, and he's coming with his primary men or members of the wedding party. And he's coming to get his bride. And in verse 7, it says, let us... Be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Who's, who's the Lamb? Yeah. You know, it's, it, the, the Lamb of God or behold the Lamb of God uh, it occurs in the Bible 28 times. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it occurs in the book of Revelation 28 times. We see it in chapters 5, 6, and 7, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, 19, 21, 22. It just goes on and on. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. And we know this Lamb of God is Jesus. We see that in Revelation chapter 5 where we read this. And one of the elders said unto me, weep not. You remember the story? So John is in the throne room of God. God the Father sitting on the throne. And he's got a seven sealed scroll in his hand. And there's a search that goes out all over earth and all over heaven and all over creation for somebody worthy to take the scroll and open it. And no one was found worthy. And the Bible indicates that John is so heartbroken that he begins to weep. And the angel says, weep not. Behold, the, land, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, which sent forth across the world. Here we see the Lamb of God. And, and this, is, this is the groom. And he's coming again to gather his bride. What did Jesus tell his disciples before he left? He said, don't worry. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I have prepared that place for you, I'm coming back to get you so that you can be where I am forever. Man, most of the songs in our hymn book are about that, that very thought, isn't it? That we've got this place in heaven. If God created this earth in six days, as beautiful as it is, if he created all of the heavens and all of the stars and all of the galaxies, and he did that in six days, I just saw some new pictures that they've gotten. They have a new telescope that's up in space, and it looked into a, an area that they've never looked into, and it's looked further than they've ever looked, and they found Thousands of more galaxies out there that they never knew existed. You know, that is the glory of God. Right. James Webb Telescope. James Webb Telescope. There you go. It, it's amazing if you get a chance to see that. You know, the, the Bible says, I think it's in Jeremiah. God says, when you can figure out how I hung the earth. And when you can find the end of my creation. Then I will give up my people Israel. Why is the universe so expansive if, all, if we're the only ones here? Because God's showing you how great his love is for us. And how great his love is for Israel. That he says if you can get in a starship and fly at the speed of light. And you can finally reach the edge of my creation. Then I'll give up my people. Ain't going to happen. 
If you got close, he'd just create some more, I think. But he made it big enough so we'd understand. So, so we know the Lamb of God is this one Jesus, and that he's made a promise. But who is the bride? Now, now there's, there actually is some conflict among scholars about who the bride is, and I can't understand why there's any conflict at all. Some say that the bride is Israel. Well, here's a problem. Israel is called the wife of God. She's never called the bride of God. Now, she's an unfaithful wife. We know from the story of, um, of what's the names? Gomer and Hosea. Gomer and Hosea. That God painted a picture. You remember that story? God tells his prophet Hosea to go out and to marry a prostitute. And he goes and he marries her and he brings her home. Cleans her up. Buys her new clothes. They have children together. They get a home established. Everything's going good. She's being blessed. She's living like she's never lived before. And then all of a sudden she decides to go back to her whoring ways. And she goes back to being a woman of ill repute. Goes out and leaves home. Leaves the kids. Leaves her husband. Goes out and starts doing all that again. And then God tells him, go get her. And he comes in and she's on the auction block, standing there naked, being auctioned off as a slave. And he redeems her. He buys her and brings her back in the home. And God says, that's my bride. That's my Israel. And the truth of the matter is, Israel has turned her back on God many, many times. And yet God's love is unbelievably pure when it comes to Israel. God has forgiven her over and over and over again. But Israel is a bride, not a bride. She's a wife of God. The bride is always the church. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. He says, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Now, that's Paul talking about the church. He is jealous over the church. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And she's supposed to be a chaste virgin. I worry sometimes about the church. Not, not just Glenn's Chapel, but the church as a whole. And, and where we are. Are we still pure? Are we still a virgin? What have we uh, allowed into our church functions that don't belong? Are we still the bride of Christ? There's so much missing from church worship today. There's, there's no power. There's no presence of the Holy Spirit. When, when was the last time you felt a move of the Holy Spirit? I mean a genuine, powerful move of God inside the church. It troubles me. Yes. Moved your heart, didn't it? Moved your heart. But you know, there have been in the recent past times when the Holy Spirit of God moved. People got saved. And it wasn't, it wasn't coming down the aisle saying, I've made a decision to become a Christian today. It was a broken, bawling person who God got all over and they had to get down and they had to get saved. I, I worry about the condition of the church today. You know, if, if the Word of God is not preached, if the power of God is not present, if the Spirit of God is not moving, it's not a church. It's just an organization. It's a social club. You know, and you look all over the country and you, you see churches that are doing all kinds of things that are in conflict with Scripture. Pastors that do gay weddings. I saw a picture the other day 
of a preacher standing up in his clerical robes and he had a, a rainbow sash over the top of his shoulders and he was performing a wedding for two men getting married. And, and that just blows my mind. Why does God let that happen? God is long-suffering. God is patient. God, God is going to put up with an awful lot. Not everyone will ever come to know Christ. But many will even in this last time. In fact, one of the things that's very evident in the Scripture is one of the greatest times of revival that will ever occur is during the seven years of the tribulation and the great tribulation. The Bible talks about an uncountable multitude of people that come to know Jesus Christ during those times. It's really, it's really strange that the church seems to need persecution and hardship to really prosper. What happens when things get comfortable? You know, you think about the different times in this church history. Think about when the old church burned and they had to build a new one. And then when they bought this land and they built this building and they had this debt and everybody worked hard and everybody pitched in and everybody did stuff and the church grew because there was a need and all of a sudden they got to a point where they paid the building off. There was no more debt and it just all seemed to kind of slow down. There was never no more pressure and I think that's not good and pressure will begin to come. We're, we're beginning to see some of it now. Uh, there, there, is a, uh, there is a persecution that comes but we need to look at that from a different perspective. Maybe what we need is some hard times. You know when the disciples were under the greatest stress and you listen to their prayers. They never once prayed, take this stress away from me. They never once said, keep me from this persecution. Their only concern was, God, don't let me let you down. Don't let me fail to stand in faith. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we need some pressure. But our pressure needs to not be, save me from this. Don't let me embarrass you, Lord. Let me stand in the midst of this. You know, we've kind of gotten in a habit. All we ever really pray about is, Lord, heal this person. Lord, help this person. Lord, this person's under a difficult situation. Come in and, and, and we treat God more like Amazon.com or Walmart. And, and <laughs> I was listening to a preacher on the way over here, and he said, you know, we, we sing the song, I need thee, I need thee every hour, I need thee. And God's up there saying, well, what is it you need me for? Amen. You know, you, you see signs of people sitting on the side of the road, and they got a sign up that says hungry. But what we never ask is, what are you hungry for? If you're hungry for food, I'll run you down here at McDonald's and buy you a Big Mac. If you're hungry for drugs, I don't want to give you any. The follow-up question ought to be, what are you hungry for? And when you say, God, I need you, we really ought to be willing to listen to him say, and what is it you need me for? Do you need me to take care of this temporary need that you have in this physical body? Or is there something greater than that? Would you give up what you have to have a greater relationship with God? How much is too much? Well, Ephesians 5.25, that was all free. That ran off the course with that there. Uh, 5.25 through 27, Paul writes this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Fellas, if you're married, soon will be married or someday might be married, understand that there is absolutely nothing that you should not be willing to give up to and including your own life for your wife. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. He never turned his back on her. He never abused her. He never went out on her. He never spoke ugly to her. He always loved her. But there is a different part. That he may sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself as a glorious church having not a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that it be holy and without blemish. You want your wife to be the wife you want her to be? Treat her like Christ treated the church. 
And through your love, you will wash her into a blemishless, spotless wife. But Christ wants us as a church to be that way. We're washed with the water of the word. Goes on now in Revelation 19, 19, 7 and 8 and says this. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. Now there's a responsibility for a wife in marriage. To make herself ready as well. The Bible says there in Ephesians that a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. But it also tells the wife that she's to love and respect and honor her husband as well. It has to be a two-way street. But here, this phrase, his wife hath made herself ready, is something that's very important. You know, I've, I've done a lot of weddings. I, I, I wish I had kept a record of who I married and who I buried. I never have done that. But I wish I had kept a record. And one of the things I can tell you is that I have never seen an ugly bride. Now, some are better looking than others. But all brides do everything they can on that special day to make themselves look as pretty as they possibly can. You know, it's something that that people dream, the girls dream about a large part of their life. There was a, a picture on Facebook the other night, and it showed this, this bride in her dress. And in the mirror, it showed a little girl, probably around five years old, standing on a table and holding the bride's dress up like this. And, and so the woman, who was now in the wedding dress was seeing herself as a child holding that wedding. She prepared her whole life to become married. You think about, I often wonder why they take a year of engagement. Just go get it done, right? My, one Friday night, my, my dad asked my mom before they were husband and wife, you want to get married? She said, yes. He said, when? She said, tomorrow. So they drove down to the county where they could get their blood test and their marriage license. And they went and paid, a, 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 got a preacher and he did the wedding and his wife was the witness. And dad gave him everything he had, handed him $3. That's all he had in his pocket. Of course, that was 1956. So $3 went a little bit further. But a bride wants to make preparations for the wedding. How can we as a church be prepared for the wedding. Well, we have to wash ourselves in the Word. We need to know the Word of God. Y'all were talking earlier about what translation to read. And I can understand this and I can't understand that. And I love to read this and, I, and I'm having trouble with that. We need to absorb all of that. That's one of the things that, that we do in this church is we study the Word of God. I hope that it makes a difference in your life. But that's how we, we get ready for Him. And it goes on and it says, And... It was granted. Now that word granted means to give, to bestow. And, and there was a gift given to her. She had made herself ready, but then a gift was given to her. And that gift was fine linen, white and clean, or clean and white. And the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So the bride's dress is made from the righteousness of the saints. She has been washed in water. You know, sometimes when you, when you want to wash something, there's a, there's a setting. Now, I don't do laundry. I, I, I know where the laundry room is in my house, but I don't go in there. Uh, that's not in my area. I've got a magic dresser in my bedroom, and, and whenever I open up the underwear drawer, there's underwear in there. When I open up the sock drawer, there's socks in there. I don't know how it happens. It just, it just does. I don't do it. But there's a setting on my washing machine, and you know what it says? Agitate. <laughs> you thought about that? Agitate. What does it mean? I mean, it gets in there and it agitates. It shakes that water up. It makes all kind of racket. It has to do that or the stuff won't come out clean. Now, some stuff I get on me, it won't come out clean no matter how much agitation you give it. I was working out there on this little project the other day, Saturday, and I had a pair of overalls on because 
uh, uh, the the rock chips from the from the jackhammer were hitting me when I was wearing shorts, and and I wanted to not have my legs all cut up, so I put on a pair of overalls. And then I put on a shirt and I put on a hat and I'm out there working and it's 100 degrees and I'm sweating up a dog. And I'm, I'm taking the hose pipe and pouring it over my head trying to cool off. And, and Kathy came out and, and, and she looked at me and she said, you need to go in inside and clean up and cool off. So I started heading toward the back door, but she said, but take those overalls off before you go in the house. So I stood on the back porch of my house and stripped down to my BVDs before I went in because I didn't want to carry all that. See, those overalls are going to have to be agitated. They're going to have to be agitated a lot if they're going to be made. So what do we have to do? Sometimes we have to put up with agitation in the church. We have to hold to what the Word of God says even when nobody else thinks we ought to hold to it. Well, who's the bride? The bride is the church. There is going to be, if it's not already happening, a great falling away. I need to run and hurry. The who are the two witnesses? Now, this is interesting. Remember, there are two witnesses that are not part of the family that need to be at the wedding ceremony. Who are the two witnesses? Well, we had two witnesses show up to confirm Jesus' ministry, didn't we? You remember in Matthew chapter 17... After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. So these two witnesses came. You know, in, in Jewish law, it takes two witnesses for anything to be firmed up. If, if, if you want to uh, convict me of, of a crime... You have to have two witnesses. One witness won't, do it, won't be enough. The guy says, look, I saw him do it, and there ain't no other second witness. Don't count. You've got to have two. These two came and witnessed and testified as to who Christ was. But, but there, are other, there are other witnesses that I think are more appropriate for this wedding. In Revelation 11, verses 3 and 4, we read this. I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days in sackcloth, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks that stand before God, uh, the God of the earth. Now, two candlesticks, two olive trees. Olive trees represent Israel. Candlesticks represent the church. Remember in the first part of Revelation, Christ is walking through the candlesticks. In the letters he said... Do these things or I'll come and remove your candlestick that represents the church. So these, these are those two witnesses. Now, now what happens to these guys? They get up and they preach and they testify. And for three and a half years, they're proclaiming the gospel. Nobody can touch them. Anybody tries to hurt them, fire comes out of their mouth and burns them up. That's got to be a sight to see. You're talking about halitosis. Man, it burned them up. Now, what happens though? When the Antichrist comes to power and reveals himself, when he goes into the temple and declares himself to be God, he kills these two guys. And they lay in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. There's party going on all over the world. Presents are being given. And then what happens? Revelation 11 says in verses 11 and 12, After three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up on their feet. Man, you're talking about surprising. And a great fear fell upon them which saw it. And they heard a great voice from heaven. Now, this is important. It just came to me this week. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. You remember the story of Lazarus we've been talking about? Jesus is standing outside the graveyard, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And every preacher that's ever preached that has made this comment. If he hadn't have said Lazarus, everybody would have come, right? Because of the power of resurrection. You notice here he doesn't call these two guys by name. What does he do? He speaks and says come forth. But he doesn't specify who's supposed to come forth. Now I don't know. My brain the way it works just kind of exploded. I wonder if that's when the rapture happens. When Jesus says come forth. And doesn't specify who's to come forth. 
All of a sudden, all the believers of the past come erupting out of their graves, and those that are remain and are believers go up, and they meet him in a cloud, just like these two guys did. Meet him in a cloud. I don't know. I think that that is the call to the wedding. The two witnesses and the bride come and the immediate family of God get together for the wedding. Where does the wedding happen? What's the venue for the wedding? The venue for the wedding is the Father's house. Who's the Father? God the Father. So is it possible that when God says to the two witnesses, come up here with such a powerful voice that all the dead in Christ rise and those who are alive and remain are caught up in the air and we go to heaven and we go to the Father's house which has been prepared for us and we go there to celebrate our wedding to the Lamb. I don't know. But it seems to fit to me when you look at all the other things. When will the groom go and gather his bride? When the Father has declared that everything is ready. Remember? He says, go and get your bride. Remember a few weeks ago, we looked at Jesus sitting on a cloud with a sickle in his hand. And the order came out of the throne room of God from the Father, and the angel walks over to Jesus, and he says, reap the earth. And the first reaping is the reaping of the saved. You know, that happens just a few verses before this wedding ceremony occurs. Is it possible that that reaping is the reaping of the church? Well, there's a second reaping. We talked about that. And that's the reaping of the lost. And they get thrown into the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of God. And all of that going on. Is it possible that that reaping that we read about is taking of the bride to heaven to be with him. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We go to be married to the Lamb. Well, the wedding supper. Look what it says. And he said unto them, Right, and said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are true sayings of God. So we've had the intimate marriage with a smaller group there. Now all of the invitees to the wedding. Who's going to be there? Well, I think it's going to be the Old Testament saints that believed in God. All of those that lived before the coming of Christ, that looked forward to Christ, that served God as they could. I think David will be there, and Solomon will be there, and Moses will be there, and Abraham will be there. And all of these different ones will be there. I believe they're going to be there. They're going to be invited guests. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus called John the Baptist a friend of the groom. He is invited to the wedding. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet, even though he was a prophet recorded in the New Testament. He was actually in the Old Covenant because Christ had not yet died. All right? And so John the Baptist is a friend of the groom. He and Israel come. Who else is there? All the believers throughout the history of Christianity. Peter, James, and John will be there. You know, all of the different ones, Matthew and, and all those guys, and, and all the people that came to know Christ throughout the, 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 the period of evangelism that went out. You and I will be there. Whether we're resurrected from the dead or whether we're raptured off of the earth, we'll be at the wedding ceremony. We'll be part of the bride. We'll be part of the celebration. There'll be those who, got, who died during the tribulation period or the great tribulation period that occurred after the rapture of the church. Those believers that came afterwards, they will be part of the invited guest at the wedding supper. And the word blessed means all oh, the joy, all oh, the happiness, Oh, the blessedness. It's the same word that Jesus used in the Beatitudes in Matthew. He, he talks about how wonderful these things are. In the book of Jeremiah, and I'll finish with this, we read about a time when there is no joy 
in Jerusalem and how that time is replaced by the joy and celebration of a wedding. Listen to this. Thus saith the Lord again, there shall be heard in this place which ye say shall be desolate without a man, without beast, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without a man, without an inhabitant, without a beast. There's no joy in Jerusalem. Then it says, the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of a bridegroom, the voice of a bride, the voice of them that shall say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. There's coming a day in the midst of a horrible time of suffering on the face of the earth. When there is no joy. When there is no happiness, when it's called the great tribulation and the tribulation, in the midst of that time, God has promised a great wedding celebration. And we're going to get to be part of it. Isn't that just cool? It's exciting, isn't it? All right, any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, you're going to get into that. I knew you'd pick up on that. Seven horns and seven eyes and the seven spirits of God. We've talked about that once before. And to be honest with you, there's very little that can be discerned from Scripture to explain that. I'll try again someday. Yes, sir. I, I think uh, very possibly this is just the hypothesis when it speaks of the seven spirits of God. It's the seven aspects of the work of the yeah. Holy yeah, that's that's pretty. Yeah, that's the pretty common definition of that, um, and it might very well be. It's just one of those mysteries we don't know. I mean, it's it's a good definition, and it, and it, and it works pretty good. But I don't know if that's it or not. Right, anything else? 